Hi, I'm Milo meow. Denison. Oh, hello. Do you wanna, is there a cat there somewhere? Oh, I said meow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, nice. did. I thought it was a I thought there was a cat for a moment. I, I did too. I thought the, the meow sound would actually work well with your intro music and you <laughs> just kind of kind of blend, you know, sort of mix yeah, it we'll, over that somewhere. We'll, we'll chop meow. it into the we'll chop it into the edit and the opening yeah. opening titles. The op- opening music, yeah, that works. Hi, I'm Milo Dennison. And I'm Kev Bamboo, and this is Rip It Up. Rip It Up is a topical show about life impacting creators around the world today. Yeah, and, and tonight is a special deep dive edition of the show where we're delighted to welcome back special effects professional Rod Matsui. We'll be discussing the further origins of folklore, conspiracies, cult film, and more. Um, Hello. But before we get, uh, before we get <laughs> started talking to Rod, Milo, you recently discovered that the UK is home to the sporting events of Shrove Tide Football, World Bog Snorkeling Championships, <laughs> and Cheese Rolling. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So um, so the football thing's kind of weird. Like it happens in this one little town in kind of the middle of nowhere. And basically they have just this massive, massive crowd of people. And they're broken up into two teams. And 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 you the, basically they throw a ball in the middle of this massive crowd. And the idea is to get the ball to one goal on the one side of the town or a goal on the other side of town. And literally it's just massive groups of people trying to like grab this ball and wrestle to get it to one side of the town. And they have like weird rules too. Like one of the rules is no killing somebody. All the local businesses kind of like close their windows and door and uh, board, up, board up their windows and stuff. So people can't like break through the windows in the process of, cause it's, it's, it, you should look up like, you can look this up on, on YouTube. It's crazy looking. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I was College. actually, I, I had to do some research on this so I can, I can walk into the, the discussion knowing a little bit about it and having looked at some of it. Uh, over the years and it looks a little bit crazy yeah i would have that- no interest in being anywhere near that crowd it's it looks like a really good hurt yeah well it looks like a really good way to get smashed under a crowd of people yeah exactly i would imagine people get hurt all the time in that i would think so yeah, yeah it's weird uh, it, it's funny the cheese rolling thing i gotta get i get the, you watch the cheese rolling videos it's the same thing these guys are running down this hill oh, super fast gosh. and being yeah. dragged off yeah my uncle i actually have an uncle and he used to do a rodeo he has a big piece of property outside of spokane and he would do a rodeo actually uh regularly and they did a um whiskey run and it was basically the same thing so everybody gets to the top of the hill and you <laughs> run to the bottom of the hill as fast as you can and whoever gets to the bottom of the hill uh, gets a bottle of whiskey and it was literally the same thing uh, although i don't think pe- i mean as many people got hurt doing that he doesn't do it anymore he doesn't do the rodeo anymore i think he's kind of aged out of it but i don't know what to say to that <laughs> <laughs> i never did it my sister did it once actually she got up there and did the uh, the run down the hill thing did she got a free uh a free i don't remember if she won or not i was yeah, I wasn't there that year, so but I do remember her telling me she did it, but I don't remember if she told me if she won or not. The the yes. cheese roll competition is mm-hmm. is a very strong idea, I think. Yeah. I've seen a little of that too. That's weird too. Why yeah. the hell and would that, you want that, that dates back years as well, you know, like a mayor of the town in Gloucester, you know, in the eighteen hundreds basically just said, I'll roll this cheese down the hill if you can get it. It's yours, basically. <laughs> so, and now everyone goes crazy, yeah. you know, to all chase and break limbs and all at the expense of one big kind of, I think it's a nine pound round of uh, a wheel of cheese. So, Does the cheese break apart ever? I, I, I don't know, but I mean, crumbly, crumbly cheese. I mean, we've got, we've got some crumbly cheese here, haven't we, Mike? I think some little Yeah, cheesy. so you can't see this, Rod. Um but Kev mailed me 
three because little I know bags. Milo is such a fan of cheese. That- yeah, three little bags of ch- of cheese crackers of different types of cheese cracker or cheese puffs. Ooh. I don't really know what they are. Wow. I haven't opened them. They're like solid pieces of cheese. Yeah, so. it says high in protein. Okay, are are the crackers actually made out of cheese? Um, let's see what this says. I, I think they're just pure 100% baked cheese. Until yeah, it says okay. 100% tums. cheese on the package. It says no carbs, yeah. no sugar, no junk, high protein, vegetarian yep. friendly, gluten free, 100% cheese. Shall we give one a go? Yeah. That's the real thing. Okay. Yep. Unadulterated cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Unadulterated cheese just whacked in the oven. And- so I'm going to try the Gouda one. I see you have your own personal cheese. Yeah. Mm. As per <laughs> Kev. Thanks, by the way, Kev, for uh, mailing ah. me this cheese. It, um, no problem, buddy. I've got Red Leicester, which is quite tangy. Yeah, actually. I mean, just, it just kind of tastes like, um, you know, dried, crunchy cheese things. It's not bad. It's like cheese, cheese croutons, aren't it? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, I can see. Put these on the salad. Are these All beet right. cheese it? It's me. It's making me want cheese. Can you hear us <laughs> chewing? Is that making you want cheese? You like well, well, yeah, well, I'm <laughs> thinking about cheese, and I the only cheese I have in the, uh, in the fridge is American cheese slices, which is okay, but it's not. <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's uh, there's nothing wrong with American cheese. It's just not the best thing in the world. Yeah, I like American sliced cheese for doing grilled cheese sandwiches because it melts so nicely. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. It's yeah. I didn't mean to see. I'm not. I'm not trying to say that American cheese is bad. It. Ha- I. I have some. Obviously, I. Eat yeah. It. It's yeah. Me just too. Not. Really but it's certainly not the best cheese uh, out there. Obviously, and I think anyone will. It's, a, it's. It's a cheese for the common person. Yeah, it's which for, is us. <laughs> well, yeah, when when we're feeling like the common people we are, yeah. we that uh, we have that. Yeah, it's the so, it's the Marvel Cinematic Universe of <laughs> cheese, <Jeez>. mass produced. <laughs> yeah, every slice is pretty much the same as the just, others. Just 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 bashing out <laughs> cheese after cheese after cheese, <laughs> yeah. marvel after marvel after marvel. <laughs> so, so Rod, um, what would you say? Would you would you um? Would you endorse those sports for people to take part in? Would you would you encourage people to take part in the um, cheese rolling, bog um, snorkeling, and um, what was the other one? Uh, turn up football, the uh, Shrove Tide football. Would you encourage people to do it? Uh, uh, seriously, I, I'm I'm going to say no. <laughs> I to agree. Either of them, I I really yeah. I mean, I think it would be. It would be wrong uh, for me to endorse that type of behavior, not to mention potentially uh, dangerous to me. If I if I did endorse it and somebody went ahead and did that, you know, that's not my freaking fault. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I mean, you know, if everyone that enters, it's got to be adults, so they they are all responsible for their own actions, and uh, you know, there you have it. So Rod Matsuri does not endorse. Shrove Tide football. No, I don't endorse it. Or, at all. Or, um, I'll, I'll, I'll the box snorkeling you, seems kind of kind of fun. If you did it, if you did it, I'll give you twenty dollars. But I'll 20. not endorse. <laughs> I'll pay you I'll pay each you time, it. each time, or just the once. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. But that's not, not endorsing it. That, that's that's a strictly a financial transaction. <laughs> you do it if you if you wish to. I think I might have to I might have to tap you up on the uh, on the bug the bug snorkeling one would be would be my one I think. Oh I God! Go. I forgot about the bug snorkeling. <laughs> that, that, was, that just looks sound. cold too. That messed up. Now, now I brought up the movie The Magic Christian. Have, have either of you seen that movie by any chance? No. It's the um, Peter Sellers, isn't it? Yes, and hmm. uh, I believe Ringo Starr is in that. Yes, he is. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And uh, as I recall, uh, the the movie is about a a rich person who's trying to uh, discover the lengths to which people will go to become rich, what they will do 
what you know what what you do is there anything people won't do for money right and the end of the movie has uh, uh lots and lots of dollar bills being stirred into a giant giant tank of human refuse okay and uh, which looks real by the way it looks like it's real sewage raw sewage and yeah, looks horrifying grim. but all these dollar bills are stirred into it and then a crowd of people are invited in to jump into this uh, tank of uh, filth and get as many dollar bills as they can. And then 30 or 40 people pe- proceed to jump in and grab the money that they can. Yeah, that doesn't sound... It's a good, it's a good metaphor, though, of, of like the human society, isn't it, I suppose? I bet you that's, that that's, people would do that. That's the Well, that's the end of the movie, and... It appears as though because that filth looks real, it looks like the actors really just did it. And in fact, they they it, it looks like the actors might even have been able to keep whatever they did grab while <laughs> they were swimming in the filth, which you had to do to get the money out of it. And and there's no there's no dialogue, as I recall. That's how the movie just ends. It's it just ends by showing you like this is the truth and then the end. Movie's over. Ha 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 ha. It's 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 not a very funny or happy ending, actually. And the movie itself is quite odd. Mm. Well, I'll check it out. Yeah, and it is. I mean, it is a bizarre kind of of movie in some respects. I'm kind of talk, talking to bizarre. I want to I want to get have a little quick chat with you about um, about the Scanners, obviously, movie franchise that you um, you did some work on. And where you oh, create yeah. a really, yeah, you create a really ambitious mechanical SFX um, for the splitting head in um, in Scanners Two, the Showdown. So, can you tell us more how you like how you created that? Because I, I I saw that and I thought that's that's amazing. Like it's a, at the time and the, the era that it was created. It how how did you create it and how would that differ from like the iconic um, exploding head that was created by um, Gary Zeller in the original Scanner movie? Okay, well, uh, I I do I do want to uh, uh, well nod nod over in uh, Gary Zeller's direction for his pyro effect and uh, Mark Schwartz I believe was one of the uh, uh, artists that built that gelatin head that they well, I, okay I'm going to have to look that one up but Dick Smith and uh, Chris Wayless and men, many other people were involved in, in the various effects sh- scenes in, in the first Scanners movie. And yeah, I'm aware have, that Gary, um, I think he shot the head, I think. I, 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 I believe you're well. correct, yeah. He actually did the exploding of the head. He yeah. was the, yeah, the, the pyro guy, as we, as we say. Pyrotechnics person, pyrotechnics technician or artist uh yeah which is a, a isn't that is that not a beautiful exploding exploding gelatin head us that's yeah, it's gorgeous incredible i'm not it's for the, for the, like say for the time and the, the the era of you know the day that would all be cgi you know essentially um so, yeah, so the creativity there to do that at the time and to make it look realistic is it's, yeah, it's incredible so what about your your um the splitting, you know, the splitting head because the effect. The splitting uh, up. Well, the okay, that Scanners movie, which which was released in the United States as Scanners: The Showdown, um, that was a sequel to Scanner Cop. Uh, okay. Yeah. One, you know, one of the many Scanners uh, sequels, and uh, our movie, uh, uh, Scanners: The Showdown, had some exploding people also. Um, but we wanted to add other things to the uh, effects plate and do other things besides just blow people up. You know, there there were different melting and imploding effects and puppets were made uh, that could show people kind of shriveling up and crumpling down. Um, some of those puppets were built by, by a bunch of other people. And, and of course, Chris Robbins and Nick Mara were in there. Uh, kind of supervising the puppet construction. Um, and this one, the guard whose face splits open, 
that's just a makeup, believe it or not. Like it's a, it's a rubber piece that's mostly on one side of his head. Okay. And it's, it's built out deliberately because um, I wanted the effect that uh, I, I kind of had this image of taking a, a grapefruit, for example, and just digging my fingers into the grapefruit and ripping it open sideways and just stretching the whole grapefruit apart and looking at this kind of hole inside, right? I wanted it to look like that. So the sculpture was done to just uh, it create the impression that a, a, a portion of his skull was grabbed and cracked open and pulled off of his face. Now, this was all built up on top of his head, so any impression that you're looking inside his head is part of the illusion. See, that's not a puppet head. That's actually the actor. So the, the sculpture is designed to have lines that make you perceive the idea that his head has split open and has opened like a, like a clamshell almost, right? And your eye seeing that, that, like when you look at the design, that it, cre it the, the effect is created by the, the shape of the clay sculpture that was done on that guy's uh, face cast. And then once that was made as a rubber appliance, uh, it was then rigged up with a, a moving eyeball and a couple of other cables uh, inside the rubber piece that could pull on that thing and make it open a little bit wider while the eyeball was also moving. That's a, that's a really good example of a mechanical effect that usually you'd build a whole mechanical head for. But in this case, we got a lot out of a much smaller construction and very simple mechanics that were operated through cables running basically back the guys in, in back of the of the actor's neck and down his shirt. Oh. Was and that was, reusable or was it kind of a one and done type of thing? Typically, appliances because they have very fine blending edges uh, that that deteriorate upon removal, and they're made out, out of uh, a very weak materials. They can only be used once. Okay. If if they're reusable, they're usually designed in a special way to make them reusable. Yeah, that's, kind of like a key, speaking, that's a key take moment, isn't it? You know, for filming wise, because also they've got to like, yeah, we've got to get this shot. Yeah. Don't screw it up. Well, yeah, because um, you might have a couple of actors in, in expensive makeup, but then you've also got the camera people, the sound people and the, and whatever crew that there is, everyone is being paid to be there and record, you know, to film this sequence. And you better get it while everybody's there or you are costing everybody a lot of money. Absolutely. They're breathing down your neck. Absolutely. Well, that's cool, though, like the way you were able to do the special effects that, along with the makeup, especially because, you know, CGI wasn't really used then, which is pretty much, you know, what they would have done now. I, speaking of stuff, I watched Monstrosity after our last call. And, oh uh, yeah, I, I'm aware. Just... Of, I'm aware that you watched Monstrosity. <laughs> yeah, you saw my <laughs> review. <laughs> I did. I I watched it, and and you, and I'm you might even have seen my comment. I, was, I did. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was surprised. I was, okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, what What would you like to know about Monstrosity? Yeah. We. I I need to say first of all, that's a hard film to find. Like, uh, I, we, we did some searching to track that film down the DVD of that film. Okay. But here's the, here's the thing with monstrosity. So like there's a scene, there's all these intestines like that are, are yeah. they getting reused from what? So like, there was like the girl's intestine, the intestines going in the guy, there was the girl, girl's intestines coming out. Were all those the same intestines just reused for each scene? Mm -hmm. Actually, no. Um, <laughs> oh, we thought they were. <laughs> No, I thought no, so. it was off to play. Because yeah. I think you're talking about the intestines going into Frankie. Yep. Right. Yeah. The monster, mm -hmm. and uh, not the not the intestines being pulled out of uh, the girl. I forget the character, but yeah, the girl uh, played by Audra R Ribeiro. Yeah. Um, 
I believe those are actually two different things. Oh, okay. But, but I'm actually not sure. And, and I, I would, I would go back. I'm, I'm going to go look at the film again, just to check to make sure that I'm telling you that that accurately. Cause I mm. actually don't remember. We could have reused them. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Cause it kind of seemed uh, like it. It's funny. Cause that film, it did, it's terribly edited. Like, I, lo- I love cheesy B movies like this, but the editing on that film is not good. <laughs> it, okay. Have, have you seen any other Andy Mulligan films? No, that's the thing. I have a feeling they're all within that style. I would imagine so. Oh, you, uh, you, 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 your feeling is correct. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, it, it's true. I think pe- people, there's a general understanding that, that I agree with that Milligan was um, pretty much the bottom of the barrel of no budget filmmakers. This was the very low end of that. Hmm. The very you could go with non actors playing characters, any you know hire anybody. It just doesn't matter. Just get it done. Um, and yeah, it, they're trying. Yeah, they're trying to pad it out for runtime. So. Yeah, they're they're writing a lot of additional scenes that <laughs> do nothing but just extend the the runtime. Although I, I do think there is a story to monstrosity that's very interesting. Uh, that the uh, initially the monster is built to avenge the the murder of the girl, but after that's accomplished, um, the Students who have built the monster go through different levels of becoming power mad and become monstrous themselves and then use the monster to go out murdering anybody they think is, you know, uh, deserving yeah. of being excommunicated from society, drug addicts, killers, etc. Um, and then in the end, the monster ends up killing, you know, his the creators students. yeah and goes off yeah killing his creators so there's a there's there's a moral arc there yeah that's a good point actually because yeah it, it basically the storyline of the reason why the original the monster was killed was created pretty much ends halfway through the movie and then it turns into like the love story with the monster and the girl and then yeah the story of the monster's relationship with the guys who are then basically just saying hey we got this guy let's go out and yeah take out everybody who we think is a bad person and use him for that well there, there's no reason there's no reason to murder the girl uh, no that was ridiculous Frankie. yeah i mean they they do that just because I don't know. I think just because what they want her out of the way, they, they want, they, they believe that the love Frankie and Jamie Lee share together pollutes their control over the power of the monster. Yeah. Or something like that. It's, <laughs> it's unusually <laughs> subtle. Yeah. That's, yeah. But there's, def- there's the, definitely the- a, um, there's definitely, a, there's definitely a story of retribution in there in some ways, like you said, there's, there's that moral element, but, it is, I mean, it is, it is, it is a, it is a great cult horror film. I think for, for its kind of badness, like Milo said, in terms of like the editing and thing. I mean, that's what makes it, you know. Yeah, it's cool. one of those films that you have to appreciate it for what it is. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I still, I still love, you know, your story about kind of like hiding the, you know, hiding the Gumby. Hiding the, in, I was and, looking for the Gumby and I couldn't find it. So you, you I don't really did it well. It's, I don't think you can see the Gumby in that scene. Okay. Cause I was looking for it. Cause I knew it, it would be there. Yeah. The, uh, the dark, dark romances from 1986, which, which was immediately previous to monstrosity uh, that had a, a Gumby in it that definitely showed up on screen. Okay. One of, one of- I- I mean, I do, I do really love, love the kind of that. You're, that's like, that's your like, that's the Rod Matsui kind of Easter egg thing, which I, you know, I really, I really love that. And there's talking of more obvious, like physical, physical effects in in movies, like the mask uh-huh. made for um, Frank Lelogia's um, The Lady in White. But you also restored one of the original Geiger alien suits, didn't you, Rod? Um, and I really, really would love to hear some more about that. And I, and I don't know how to pronounce. 
Geiger's name or Giger's name. Uh, I've I've always called him Giger. I've heard Giger and and Giger and. <laughs> I'm quite sure there's I'm been just... every iteration of Giger Geiger. I just go by Geiger counter, um, and that's my take. But yeah, yeah. I'd love to know yeah, about but, that but, kind of the suit. We go, why don't we go with Geiger just because of you? You like Geiger counter, and we'll we'll go with that. But yes, I, I restored uh, one of the original Alien costumes. Yes. What, what would you like to know about that? Because many people don't know about that. Yeah, I, mean, I, of... I just kind of, I, in some ways, just how you kind of, or how you got to, how you got to that point, because not everyone can get their hands on a, you know, on a Geiger, you know, aliens. You know. Yeah, so was is it like yours? Like you got it and decided to restore it? Or was it a work project or... Uh, I, oh, it, this was strictly a work project that I was paid for, and it belonged to somebody else. and it, And it was being restored and put back together so that it could be sold at auction. Uh, and it was sold at auction for, I think, something like a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Damn. Or something like. That. Okay. And when was what, what year would this have been around roughly? This would have been around 2005 or six, I think. Yeah, I could so be wrong, but, but that's that's a good that's a, yeah around there. So 2005. It's a, hefty old, it's a hefty old hefty old fee, but you know massively sought after kind of item. But so, what kind of yeah. state was the was the suit in um, when you got it? Because obviously you restored it, but it must have been in a certain level of acceptance, or you know you know it must have been. It was, it, it was completely within, it was a pile of shreds of pieces that that mainly constituted the body suit of the creature because there was no head and there was no mannequin to assemble the suit onto either and another person built a mannequin of, of sufficient stature to the proper measurements that I could glue the suit onto uh, so I took all the suit sections that there were and assembled them over this plastic mannequin which was posable with wire inside so we could kind of mess around with it and wherever there were pieces that were just gone i filled it in with something that looked like uh, the original costume you know some sometimes i would have to create a piece a little section to go in where something just wasn't there anymore or had disintegrated completely it's actually total kind of new, new, new rebuild kind of thing on that those sections. It's, yeah, I mean, what, what, what it's was it made? Incredible. Sorry, what was it made out of? Okay, the suit, uh, uh, the body suit was made out of latex rubber. Uh, it was str- it was fairly thin in the arms and legs and hands, and strengthened with uh, cheesecloth. There was a layer of cheesecloth attached to the latex rubber layers on the inside to give some fibrous strength. So it can be thin, but still kind of tough because of the fiber from the cheesecloth. And certain areas like the rib cage that had strong bone structures in front, those were actually uh, uh, cast inside a mold of latex that was mixed with ground cork. And the reason for that is that, uh, well, if you work with latex a lot, you know that latex shrinks. Uh, and the more you fill it with with non-shrinking fillers, the less the shrinking effect will cause distortion. And ground cork mixed with rubber and brushed into the molds will dry with a much lower shrinkage rate and stay about the same size, but it will also be uh, lightweight and tough and semi-rigid. So these kind of bone behaves structures like a work. like a setting agent, I suppose, in a way that it stops it kind of at that point. Yet you can still use it. Yeah, it's a it's kind of like yeah, it's I would call it a filler. It takes the it takes the latex and thickens it into yeah. a, a paste that I suppose you could butter into the mold in layers and allow it to dry. But the fact that the cork itself does not shrink, that only the rubber in between the particles of cork is shrinking, that reduces the shrink level 
that it keeps the size accurate because the rib cage was one of the sections of the suit that was completely unharmed. It was uh, like this, this latex and cork thing. Uh, I believe that is a, a British construction technique because I've never seen that done here in the United States. Mm-hmm. And it looked like something very old school. So I, I, I think it was some serious British uh, craftspeople constructing the suit. How long did it take you to restore? Something like four months. Wow. It took a long time. I had to rebuild the head completely. That took a couple of months by itself. Yeah. I had a rubber head that fit onto the body pretty good, but I didn't have a dome, uh, the clear plastic dome that goes over the top. So that had to be fabricated from scratch and vacuumed and then trimmed and then attached to the rubber head. And then the rubber head was fitted with uh, newly sculpted sets of teeth, including the telescoping jaw on, on the inside of the, of the first mouth. And then I put acrylic translucent membranes on the outside of the jaws. And this was all done as much as I could to match photographs of the one you see in close up in the film. That it was worn by Edwin Powell, as, as I think I, I wrote down somewhere. And Edwin Powell played the alien only for these scenes requiring wire flying. So the scenes where the alien is uh, lowering itself down from the ceiling or hanging from the ceiling curled up, kind of defying gravity. The scenes where it uh, flies out of the airlock and is holding on by the a cable with the uh, uh, harpoon going through its chest. Uh, those things were all done at Powell, not uh, the other actor who played the uh, the character most of the time. Uh, Bolahi Badejo, I believe, is the actor that played the uh, the xenomorph in most of the scenes because he was extremely slender and somewhat okay. taller than uh, than Edwin Powell and was an experienced mime, I believe. And that's why you got the unnatural weird motions out of, out of the alien that you see when Badejo is performing the character. It's cool that you were able to work I'm on glad you've given, given us extra kind of insight into that as well, because like you say, not many people, not many people know about that. So many people, I'm sure many even people I, would be interested. Even in I do not know who the costume eventually sold to. Because I apparently that is private information. I've asked about it. No one apparently no one can legally tell me or no God, one. You, can t- tell you me think who, that the guy that kind of reconstructed the whole thing would have at least yeah, or the, the guy that bought it to show it yeah. off and be like, look what I have. Yeah, well, I was kind of hoping the guy who bought it would call me. Um knowing that I worked on it, asking if I could maybe tell that person some secrets that he doesn't or he, that he or she doesn't know at this point, whoever yeah, that there could be. There could be so much more kind of information. Uh, and history, autograph it on the inside it. somewhere, rebuilt by Rod Matsui. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, but it was certainly an honor to work on it. I, I thought, yeah. And yeah, how did I get there? How did I get to a point where I was working on that? I was fixing film props for a guy who was uh, I guess finding film props that were falling apart and this was the biggest job that came through his uh, his collection of props was this thing um, a person that he knew called him up and said I've got the alien costume but it's falling apart I want to sell it but I need to fix it up and he said I know a guy who can do that and so <laughs> a little uh, uh, arrangement was made um, and it began. I didn't realize it was going to take four months, mm. uh, but it did. Yeah, yeah that's awesome, cool. awesome it didn't, project. It didn't pay that much, but it did pay. It paid the rent. Well, yeah, sure, man, yeah. How do you bid on that? Do you bid by like you just think it's going to take this amount of time and involve this much work? So you just say this is the price, or do you bill by hour? Mm. In that case, it was it was more of a flat. It was yeah. I just yeah, thought flat, right? okay. My my sensibility was this will take 
two, maybe two and a half months. Right. <laughs> I, I charged an amount of money that I thought was appropriate to that, not realizing it's basically going to take about twice that long and you're just going to have to eat it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like, you know, a third of a year, but um, yeah, I think, I think Milo's can... got a few, um, we've got, we've got a few viewer questions. Um, I think Milo's got a, one yep. Or, one yeah, or yeah, two yeah. There, I think. Yep. Yep. So we got some questions for you, right? Yeah. So right. Monica586 from New Hampshire asks, uh, what are your thoughts on witches, wizards, and goblins, uh, real beings, creatures, anything like that? So she must have listened to our uh, um, okay. uh, Bigfoot stuff. Um, so witches, wizards, and goblins. What do I think about those things? Okay. Well, Seeing as the question is posed in a in a slightly vague way, in a slightly generic way, I'm I'm going to counter that question by uh, by doing a kind of an illustrative discussion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Milo. Okay, you'll 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 see how this works in a second. I'm going to okay. ask Milo what Milo thinks about ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts, for example? Not really. I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical, uh, skeptical on a lot of stuff. Um, I would like to believe in ghosts. I think it would be freaking super cool if ghosts were real, but I have yet to experience anything that makes me believe in them. Not saying that they're not okay. real, but so far I have yet okay. to see anything that makes me believe in. I, I like, I, I like that response. It's uh, it, you didn't say they're not real. You said you don't believe in them, and that's yeah. that's uh, almost almost word for word uh, the, the response that one of the characters says in the movie, The Ghosts of Hanley House. He says, "Hey, come on! I'm not saying ghosts aren't real. I'm saying I don't believe in them. That's all. Sure, I'll spend the night in your haunted house to see what's in there, if anything. Yeah." I'll take your twenty dollar bet. So yeah, I, I enjoy that. I was I was kind of hoping you would say yes, because then I was gonna I was gonna drag you over the coals for saying yes and say like, well, if you believe in ghosts, then can you define what they are? If so you, what about you, so what about you what about yourself then, Rod, on the uh, to answer our viewers' question on I think was it which yeah, what are your well goblins definitely on? can't be real. So I guess, I mean, you have people that are like, hey, I'm a witch, I'm a wizard, I do my, like, spells, and, you know, th <laughs> I'm in my groups, <laughs> but can they actually perform magic, like, real magic, not sleight of hand, you know, magic show magic? I don't know. Okay, well, I see the... the uh, uh, I, well, I'm trying, what is the, what's the name of the questioner again? I forgot. Monica. Monica. Hey, yeah. Monica. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how to answer that question, Monica. <laughs> However, uh, I think you can refer back to my, my earlier discussion from the previous podcast about uh, reality being a continuous phenomenon. I basically believe that the vast majority of everything we know in reality is an unknown and we're merely acquainted with it and we don't understand it. So in terms of do like, if you're asking me, do I believe all kinds of things possibly exist? I'd say, yeah, the things you mentioned specifically, uh, I don't know, you know, depends on the thing you mentioned, but yeah. yeah. Goblins. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if there was something out there that some people, if they bumped into it, they'd say, yeah, that's a goblin. Yeah, I suppose I it's all about the interpretation of, of the things that we see and what we would say, oh, yeah, that's a such and such, you know, even if it looks, 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 acts and behaves totally different to, you know, say what, if Milo saw a ghost, he might not actually realize that it was a ghost. Maybe. Um, yeah, that's another question too yeah how do you know what you're if you've seeing never seen it? it yeah 
we're only seeing other people's, you know, so-called in, interpretations or, you know, examples or discussions of things that, you know, unless we see something ourselves, how will we know? How, how would you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, that... I spoke to somebody, for example, okay, I know somebody who once said, oh, I know for a fact that ghosts exist because uh, a friend of mine died at one point and for several days afterward, I would hear his car coming up the driveway and I would see the lights turn out. And so that's proof that there are spirits, you see. Um, I personally think that he was, he's, even though he may have experienced that, I think that he's drawing a, a great, some kind of, he's making an assumption. Yeah, yeah. maybe like the, the whole replacement kind of thing and the, that's partially. Yeah, hearing you things he wants to hear saying, versus yeah. what he's actually hearing. Instructing a reality, well, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, he, he might comforting. very well have heard those things, but does that prove that spirits exist? He's obviously got, I, I, I'm not saying this guy's wrong or right, but no. I'm saying a lot of people believe or disbelieve something based on their preconception of what they think exists, which is purely imaginary. Uh, e even if I say, do, do you believe in ghosts? The very word ghost is subject to your interpretation of what that means. And I'm sure it means something different for many different people. Yeah, I definitely think there's a, there's like a, there's a heightened sense of of constructed reality there in in terms of like you're saying that yes, you could hear those noises, but it doesn't mean that they are actually you know it's not Derek that you know passed away, you know two two doors down or whatever. It, it's just a sound that, an everyday sound that you may mm -hmm. hear, but you've associated yeah, or, or, it. I didn't want to mention Ouija boards, but if you mention if you if you use a Ouija board and you think something is trying to talk to you through it, how do you know that it is what it claims that it is? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that it definitely brings in that kind of like I say. It's I think people are using. I think it's like sometimes like a, especially maybe in grief and things, it's like a form a form of comfort to people, even if it's you know. Um, you know, it's not, it's kind of like subconsciously done, you know, they think, oh yeah, I've just ex-partner or whatever, you know, or my spouse or whatever. And they hear a noise, they associate it with them. And so it brings in a form of comfort because they feel that that person is kind of still with them because there's an acceptance of loss, isn't there? That's, that's, that's got mm, to that's come towards. Self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Where are you? Mm. You, you want, you want to talk to the dead person because you miss them. So yeah. during the session where you have the seance or whatever, yeah, you're going to be doing things to contribute to the idea that you're being successful because that's why you're there in the first place. Yeah, you definitely could be more more receptive to it. Um, but Milo, I mean, I know you did just kind of turn that question onto um, Milo a little bit there, but we're actually on our mini feature now, which is, Ask an American again, um, and you get another chance to pose Milo. So your your question, your totally unscripted question for for Milo, Rod. Oh, that it sucks because that was my unscripted question. Oh, well, it? perfect! It's been answered. I was I was gonna I was <laughs> Milo's like quick, to... quick, next thing. <laughs> <laughs> Unless thought, you can well, think of something else on the top of your, you know. Oh, uh, uh, no, no, no pressure. Ooh. If you drink soda, what's your favorite soda? Ooh. Um, I like uh, root beer, cream soda. I like those that that style. I guess I don't drink a lot of soda, truthfully. Um, but uh, but yeah, probably a root beer or a cream soda. Um, what's your favorite root beer? And, and do you miss root beer from? Um... Like yeah, you can't really, it's harder to you can find it here it's just much harder to find um so i have found it but no i yeah. don't really have a favorite of either ginger beer is the uk uh non-alcoholic beer that's ginger most, beer yeah it's, it's a spicy kind of a you know a brown a brown carbonated thing and uh, ginger is a root although it's yeah it's not the same as, as the flavors used for root beer but yeah, yeah. I, I like both of those things. And as a matter of fact, 
I had a cream soda just yesterday because I had not had a cream soda in years. And I thought, I'm going to have a cream soda. And so I did. Darn it. I'm glad you did. Um, well, I'm jealous, actually, because I, I, I actually want one now. <laughs> I'll just talk about cream soda. <laughs> okay. Um, but well, I, I, sh- I should good. do a shout out to Joan Soda from Seattle since uh, that's oh, my it's hood. coming out now. His, oh, his brand placement's coming yeah. out now. His... <laughs> Joan Soda root beer. And I think they do a cream they've, soda, too. I don't remember if they do cream soda. sodas, I believe. I've seen, I've seen them do spooky Halloween labels for their sodas. Yeah, they do seasonal stuff and uh, different things that will come and go. At some point, I'm sure they've had a cream soda, but I, I, I'm, I know they have a Group here, but I just don't remember if they have a cream soda or not. They're kind of artsy, aren't they? They're sort of yeah, uh, yeah, cutting edge micro brew. They're the micro brewer sodas. Are they like a craft, craft soda company. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Seattle based. My hood. All right, Rod. So since we got the question to me, you have a badly drawn bamboo for Kev. Let us see your and badly drawn bamboo. Yeah. Cool. Let's have a look. Look at that crazy. He looks, he looks like a madman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of his natural be, look, actually. Could, that, yeah, that could be, you know, pretty accurate to reality. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I, 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 you're, I, I mean, mean, you've got I the beard going on quite nice. Picture of you, I, I, I looked at a picture of you and was kind of sketching it off of you, but there was a craziness in your eyes that I was trying to capture, and I could only do it if I just kind of shut my eyes very tight and went ah, internally and then I, <laughs> oh, that, and then i do a little wiggle around the eyes and I, that's not, that's the crazy eye that he's got yeah okay that is, that's that's insane. That is, yeah there's, a, there's <laughs> an accuracy going on now i'm 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 all, I'm all over it but yeah so so show it up again rob just um yeah i've got to rate this Isn't that, so if i rate it if i rate it high it means it was really bad. I think okay. if I rate it really low, it was really, really good in terms of badly drawn bamboo. So, yeah, let's okay. have a look. Um, so I am going to give that a yeah. You got the, you got the kind of beard right, and I like the theory on the on the crazy eyes and stuff. Even though I've got really, really tiny, really tiny eyes, but um, so. I'm going to give that a six point five out of ten. I think. I I I wasn't hoping for more than that. That's about right. I, that's yeah, what that's I like would a, have given it. That's yeah, a, that's like, it's like an average to I an average to out. bad. It, it didn't take more than a couple of minutes, you know. <laughs> I thought you'd spent hours on it, Rod. Like I thought you'd spent. I thought you were going to bill me for kind of four months worth of <laughs> work four months worth of drawing I can, I can do that if you want i i, I don't i don't want to i don't want to receive the bill i'm i'm worried now about about receiving the bill but no that's um i really loved your drawing um as always okay. on this show um milo when where can people send any badly drawn bamboos to well, if you have a badly drawn bamboo audience, you can send it on Instagram to bamboo underscore creatives. That's B M B O O underscore creatives. And Kev will get that and it will be featured on a future episode of Rip It Up. Indeed, it will. Oh. <laughs> you like yeah, my, you annou- that, my announcer I, voice there? I love it. Very uh, much. Just, <laughs> just, you know, That's very really, really, really comforting. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew you wouldn't disappoint me in the uh, badly drawn bamboo stakes, Rod. Um, so, okay, we've got a couple more um, viewer questions in. So we okay. have, and I think these are people, the last one was from the US, wasn't it? These are from the UK. So we've got, so hey, Hales SB from the Midlands in the UK asked, what was your favourite film to work on and which actor did you like the least? Ooh. <laughs> uh, it's like a double uh, question, though. How could I possibly answer that second part? How could I say that? Yeah, he's in the industry. Like he can't say yeah. the least. He'll get uh he'll get blacklisted. 
Well, no, especially since I, I, when I think about it, I just don't think in those terms. Like, what's the worst actor you've ever worked with? I, I just. Oh, I they didn't say the worst actor. They just said who who did you like the least? So oh, maybe, who did I like? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they were a pain in the butt so, or something. So, fav- favorite film and like the least. I mean, I do remember from the previous show. I know that this wasn't necessarily actor, but also in, in production, you spoke about. Um, on Freddy's Dead before about some of the um, some of the crew working for the other special effects team, and you had an experience there. So maybe you know that's a little memory jogger there. But oh yeah, well uh, Fr- uh, Freddy's Dead was was interesting in that respect uh, because there were more there were multiple makeup effects teams working on the film, and occasionally we did overlap and bump into each other. Yeah, which was complex. Um, There's a bit of a kind of a us, us versus them kind of scenario going on, even if you didn't necessarily feel that way yourself. Uh, I I know I noticed it, and it was um, because it was a job, and because I I just understood that it was my job to be in there in the overlap. It just became a matter of, I guess, diplomacy. Because uh, somebody, you've got two, two or three people with makeup brushes and paints, and they're all trying to get over to Robert England to paint some blood or something on them. And depending on what you're contractually obligated to do, you either can get in there and do something or you can't, right? Sure, so yeah. whenever Freddy Krueger got stabbed, when we did uh, uh, reshoots and, and did stabbing close-ups, uh, there was, there were a few moments where I had to come in and glue something onto Robert Anglund or dress his wounds with with fake blood or something or put a wound on him, and that was that type of situation. There there would be an overlap where uh, typically MMI were not were not working on Freddy Krueger, but whenever Freddy Krueger got injured. Then we got in there and started gluing stuff, in some cases, on top of the makeup that uh, David Miller's crew had done. And that was weird, too. You know, gluing makeup on top of somebody else's makeup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like a little... That makes it extra little, complicated. Yeah, like a Not unpleasant, on... because like I said, it was... The, the job was to do that. Sure. So it was just a matter of getting in there and doing it and getting it filmed and then going home. So do you have a favorite uh, film? A favorite film? Gosh. Uh, it's, it's a split maybe between uh, what's eating Gilbert grape and uh, Freddie's dead, because those were both really uh, enjoyable experiences. Uh, Buffy, the vampire slayer, the TV show. I was on that for a while. That was a lot of fun too. Oh, that's cool. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that series. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm a kind of kind of, kind of closet fan of that. But Milo seems like an out out. What did what did you do on Buffy? Was it uh... that was all technical? That was that was working in the lab, and it was refining the the rubber vampire appliances. Most of the most of the job was touching up and refining the vampire makeup appliances before they went out to set to get applied. Sorry, Rod. Yeah, was there a lot of um, bladder work in um, Buffy? Like, was there a lot of bladders used in there? Well, n- no. I, Buffy was not, as I recall, it wasn't really a bladder show, no. Mm-hmm. Um, what what there was a lot of was, was your basic vampire face appliance with the mean brow and, uh, and the uh, cover, covering over the eyebrows and giving you these 45 degree angle kind of snarly mm-hmm. lines and um mostly it was that a lot of those went out and there were there were multiple sizes there were some generics that were made to fit many different people and then there were specific appliances that were sculpted to fit specific actors depending on who it was they were cut like custom size to fit those particular actors yeah yes yeah it, it was it was a uh, kind of an assembly line job just getting these things ready and out in plastic bags to go out to set so somebody could glue them on and color them and get them 
get them out in front of a camera. We've got another one for you, Rod. It's from Res76 okay. in Derbyshire. Res. Res. Okay. Uh, so we already, you already answered the question of how you got the job to refurbish the Geiger alien. Did you, okay. in the process at any point in time, get to use the suit? As in, <laughs> did you put it on yourself? <laughs> that would no. be awesome. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, no, but and that's that's simply because the the suit was never uh, was never available to be slipped into. It was it was being assembled, literally glued glued piece by piece into assembly over a mannequin. So there there never was a time when I could climb inside the suit. Um, there have been many opportunities, however, on other films to put on a mask that somebody has taken off and thrown in the trash. <laughs> oh, yeah? I'm not, I'm not going to say what film was, what, that was. Uh, what, what was it? The Frankie in, uh, yeah. The Frankie mask in uh, um, monstrosity. No, 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 no. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't monstrosity because that was, that was little appliances. That oh, that's true. And it was mostly just hair uh, as his, uh, orange afro and so you've already got my mind you know ticking with that now because i'm thinking of you kind of trying on these different masks from some some great films that you've worked on so like, oh yeah i'll give give that one a go, yeah. give oh, that one a go. Film, i will say it's a film that we've already talked about before so think okay. about somebody ripping a, a rubber mask off their head and throwing it in the trash because they can't use it a, a second time because it's an appliance and it should be pretty easy to figure out what character I put on after I saw it in the trash can. Absolutely. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep the secret. We'll keep <laughs> yeah. the secret there, but we know, we, we, we know, yeah. we know what you're, what you're talking about. All right. And, so- and, you, and you, re- you realize, by the way, too, right. You realize that 90% of what I've done and seen, I cannot talk about. And I'm only oh, telling yeah. you this. I'm only, you know that, right. There's all mm-hmm. kinds yeah. of stuff like you're asking me these questions like, well, what's the most exciting thing that's ever happened to you? Well, I well, these are just about... these these are just viewer questions who are really yeah, yeah. really interested in your career. And you know, we we just left that as an open open yeah. forum and picked out some of the, the best ones. So that is the catch audience of the film industry, is there's a lot of NDAs that get signed. There's a lot of like filmmakers want their films to be what you see on the screen so that that way they create that illusion. If, you know, people like Rod are out here talking about all the behind the stuff, it, it kind of ruins that illusion. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's just like stuff that I just can't talk about. You know, it, it may, it might not be something that I signed a, a non-disclosure agreement for at all. It might be just a really embarrassing story that really happened that I just, I just couldn't talk about. <laughs> because it would embarrass anybody that was mentioned, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Understandable. Like there's, like there's a, there was a time one. Okay. Once I, I've had, so now, really you're gonna, now you're going to kiss and tell. He's like, <laughs> you want to, I'll, I'll tell you a story because I can't tell you who it was, okay. uh, but I was working on film, a Larry Cohen film. And there was a beautiful actress that was w- walking towards me, uh, we were on location at a house in Hollywood and she had to walk on a path of decorative stones on the front lawn. It was one of the, like the front lawn was soft earth. And so they put those walking path stones that you walk on. Mm-hmm. And she was walking towards me to go and do something. She was one of the actors in the film and she was wearing high heels and a beautiful gown. And as she approached me, her uh, foot started to sink into the uh, soft earth and get caught on the stone that she was walking on. And she started to trip and fall over. And this is a a woman that I had seen in movies for years. And uh, as she started to fall over, uh, she uh, realized, I could see in her eyes, she didn't want to ruin the expensive dress she was wearing because it's needed for camera, right? She was going to be in front of a camera in, in a couple of minutes. And she made the decision, well, I'll just fall on this young man who's 20 years old or so standing <laughs> over here in the shade, and looked at me. 
this is all happening in, in a split second. She's making this decision. I'll just fall on him. He'll stop me from falling in the mud. I won't be in trouble from production. And I give her a kind of a look like, you're going to fall on me? Okay, fine. I don't care. And she then does that. Um, and then she apologized to me saying, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. And I said, it's quite all right. You know, I, I have fallen in the mud to prevent her from falling into it. And I get up and brush myself off as she walks away. <laughs> very nice. beautiful actor. It's, it's very charming. And I, and I understood absolutely there, there, she wasn't trying to like make a date with me. I was quite, I was quite aware of that. And I was very happy to prevent her from getting in trouble with production. They don't usually like on, on a lot of low budget movies, they don't have duplicate costumes for everybody. They can't afford it. That might've been the only dress of that kind they had. It makes sense. I mean, she was being a professional. She's like, what's more important here, this dress over anything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause the dress yeah. gets messy. That's delaying the shoot and potentially costing and, uh, money. Yeah. yeah. Well, Rod, you can't, you can't see cause on rip it up this um, in this second season that we've got uh, me and Milo have now gone to extra you know extra camera angles and things that we started you know playing around with. Uh -huh. So okay. on my on on my on camera two of mine, which I'm just pointing to over here and looking into right now. So behind yeah. me on either of my shoulders, Milo doesn't know this as well. I've got a Bigfoot wearing shades. It's an image of a Bigfoot wearing shades. And he's he's actually riding um, the Loch Ness monster, like wakeboarding on the Loch Ness monster. Um, but you'll see that. Did you say he's wearing cheese? No, he's wearing shades, <laughs> um, like glasses, okay. sunglasses. Yeah. To be honest, yeah, no, knowing, knowing Kev, I would believe that the, that he would have cheese. <laughs> Could so, easily have some so cheese the, eyes. So, to wear shades? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, he's got uh, sunshades on. He's riding, wakeboarding on a uh, Loch Ness monster in, in the loch. And I think behind it is like a, a desert island, I think there is. Like a little, just right down, I'll move out and you'll be able to see. Wow. Um, yeah, there's like a desert island. So it's almost like a Walter Mitty's fantasy island. So this image is like a kind of, you know, an amalgamation of kind of um, folklore. I it guess. would make me really happy if like, 30 seconds ago, you you started to fade in a public domain uh, copy of uh, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite, uh, uh, The Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies. I think that's yeah. a perfect background track to be using for this, don't you think? It's well, working can, fine, right? It, it, yeah, it certainly, it certainly would, as long as we don't get copyrighted on it. <laughs> yeah, until we get copyright flagged. We, we might get flagged. <laughs> copyright yeah. violation. There's um, public domain. Uh, Oh, I'll see if I can find a public domain. Yeah, some, some classical stuff is, is uh, pretty free. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I have a question, by the way. Yeah, I, you want to hear something funny? Sure. Do you guys Over. know of a band from the 80s, uh, a, a new wave band or whatever you want, a rock band called The Fix? F-I-X-X? -X? I don't it's, think so. No, I don't. It could, it could be that I'm just like old and it's from that time. But they had a great album called. I mean, Reach music the is tra music's transcendent, isn't it? You know, it can be any era. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I know, I know, I know a ton of sixties music, but and they're they're a British band, Kev. I mean, come on. Yeah, but there's tons you of should, British I, bands. I don't even. I don't even. <laughs> I know nothing about they, my own country. <laughs> okay, well they they had a song called "Saved by Zero. Okay. And it, and it's very very catchy. And you, that and sounds it, Go go find the fix saved by zero and it's got a real catchy hook and it goes maybe someday saved by zero okay got it okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I started uh, uh, I, I was listening to the song while I was reading something about Bigfoot and I started thinking well what if, what if we just did a variation of the song called saved by Bigfoot and yeah. just it's exactly the same, but whenever he says zero, then you just sing Bigfoot instead, and then yeah, the just background switch it out. Saved by Bigfoot, ah, ah, like that, right? It's really funny. Try it. 
Saved by the, Bigfoot. Everybody, yeah. Saved by Saved Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Yeah. Cool if I heard the, yeah, if I heard the song, that'd be cool. It does Saved sound familiar. Bigfoot. That tune does. Saved, Saved by, by Bigfoot. Bigfoot. That is a serious groove. I reckon yeah. it's probably going to be one of those tunes that, because there's loads, there's loads of tunes by bands in the UK that no one knows the band name, or not many people know the band name. But then they okay. know, the, and they don't even know the name of the song. But that everyone knows, knows the tune. I mean, the, not even a band, but there's like there's tons of classical pieces of music that are used by the BBC, um, in between like for eye dance on on TV shows, and also on on like um, nature programs. And everybody knows, you know, everyone that's seen those programs knows the music. And there's so uh, there's a pianist called uh, Ludovico Einaudi, who I'm a massive fan of anyway, before the pieces that I was aware of that were used on the BBC. And I, I was listening one time, I was like, oh yeah, I recognise that piece of music. And then I, I found out that it was Einaudi. Um, But I've said to people, oh, have you heard of, you know, Ludovico Einaudi? And they're like, nah, nah, I don't know, don't know him at all. And it's like, yeah, but I bet you've heard his music because it's just used so so mm. frequently on these, on these items. Right. So it's, yeah, so... That, that uh, the fixed tune could be, you know, I'm going to give it a listen after the show. And I'll probably be like, oh, yeah, pretty hell, I know that song. Yeah, it's uh, probably it's one of those things, it. you know the song, and then you, f- yeah, just can't think like of I it. Think the, the, yeah. Like the chain, I think that's another tune. You know, it's, it's it's a great, great tune. And it's just in the, well, in the UK at least, everyone knows it. And it's the one that's just a riff that's. And in the UK, that is. Oh, Every, everyone will know that tune. Me doing that. Everyone in the UK will know that tune, but they won't necessarily know the uh, title or the or the artist. Like like everybody knows the the Hammer Dracula theme from uh, James Bernard, right? The da da, da Dracula. Yeah. Taste the blood of Dracula. Dracula. Da, da, da. Dracula. Da, da, da. Sometimes in, in the commentaries, uh, uh, Christopher Lee and some of the other actors did commentaries for uh, the Dracula films, and occasionally they'll they'll do that. They'll they'll start humming Dracula. It's so much fun. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I have to look those up. That's cool. Um, we mentioned Bigfoot there for a second, so here's a question for you, Rod. Okay. So. Yeah. As a um, you know, fan of Loch Ness, Bigfoot, Chupacabra, all that kind of stuff, how would you go about as a special effects artist creating the most convincing fake history of a mythology creature? So, how would you fi- basically fake one of these? How would I fake? You mean like any animal? Any yeah, kind of like animal? let's say you were going to create a, a Loch Ness monster. Like, how would you create the Loch Ness monster? To fake it, to make people think that it actually exists. Yeah, the, yeah like the most convincing fake or the genuine yeah. fake or whatever. Yeah. How would you go? I don't know. No, the, 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 I think my, my answer to this question is a little strange. I think it's already been done. I, I think the, uh, the, 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 the well, we're talking host- about you, Rod. Like, like, what would you do? Not what anyone else would do. What would, what would you do with, like, well, say, a, a, to make a, a mythological? or so-called mythological creature used to create a fake, how would you go about doing it? Because you've got the skills. That's what I'm I'm trying to to say here. I I would do exactly what has been done because it works. Like the- You you saying you've actually, you know, I might have gone out into, you know, the woods or a forest and I've, and I've seen a Bigfoot and I'm, and actually it's a Bigfoot mate. It's got a scribe on it saying, Made by Rod, Rod Matsui. Um, <laughs> or I've gone out to Scotland and I'm, I've been at the lock and, you know, I've seen the old head pop up and it's, it's a mechanical piece created by you. Uh, wow. That's, <laughs> you, you come <laughs> up with, with some very interesting questions. I, uh, um, <laughs> no, I'm just theorizing really. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, that's, Kind of like the irony of if I'm out there one day now, I'm like, I see it and I'm like, yeah, Rod, that's Rod, Rod's done that. <laughs> well, I, I have actually created fake ghost photos and 
put them online saying that they're real. I've I've done fakes. It's not like I haven't so that's, done that. So that's that's cool because that's kind of what's being asked, I suppose, in the questions. How, so how would you go about making a, you know, a, oh, one, of the, okay. one of the best well, fakes you know, in history? Okay, the, it, I, I think I can address your question a little better then. Okay, yeah, I made one ghost photo that I thought was just freaking brilliant. I made up a fake story about it. Uh, I found some photos on the internet that I put together and photo composited. I just found a picture of the side of a, of a freeway, a kind of like a dirt, um, a dirt grade at the edge of a freeway um, in the dark, taken in flash photography. And I composited it in a, like a, a, an element of a painting of a woman in a Victorian dress, you know, and made it translucent and uh, also kind of messed around with the face to make it sort of cartoonish and unreal, kind of mess with the reality of it. And then over the top of everything, I, I found a picture of some smoke and then composited a thin layer of wispy smoke over the whole image just to further confuse the mind as to what it was looking at. And then I, I put the image up somewhere online with a story that it's a stretch of highway somewhere near me in Los Angeles, which is known for uh, being haunted by this woman. And this is a photograph, a real photograph of the ghost. And uh, I liked it. Um, I think it fooled some people, but I, I don't know where it is now. I, I, I'd have trouble finding that photo, but I have done it. I, li I like, sure. though, how you actually, that, that how you said you tried to make it not look convincing, and yet people were still, you know, very much, you know, Convinced bought into the whole illusion of it, yeah. Well, uh, a lot of the a lot of the early spiritualist fake photography examples will include uh, some kind of double exposure of a drawn character that is like something like a painting or a drawing on paper that is itself two dimensional and not really very beautifully done either. So it looks unreal, but that's that fooled a lot of people like there there was a, an ethereal quality to the cartoonishness of it that actually convinced people and so that that was an effort to make it as as though if a spirit were trying to record a picture on film it was having trouble making a perfect replica of itself in its previous life and so the features of the face are kind of formed you know, like imperfectly or crudely. And to me, I thought it looked a lot creepier that way. Yeah, I like the I like the approach. Yeah, it's well, it's like it's, you're, it's like a psychological uh, uh, effect, right? You you know you know that someone is going to be staring at it and trying to figure out what it is for realism, so you deliberately throw something in that looks somewhat fake. And I'd call that a, a distraction. Um, other other people, I've I've talked with this. I talked with other people about this before. It's called a false flaw, where you are presenting a piece of artwork and you deliberately put something there to draw the audience's attention away from what the real truth is. In this case, it's a completely fake ghost photo. But yeah, it's, you, the, it's the whole, it's the whole deflection. The yeah. The, yeah, you have to get inside the audience's head, I think. Or to, yeah, it, try, and see, try and see what, they're, yeah, see what they're seeing from their kind of point of view. Help them think, yeah. So, Rod, um, I've got another, another great um, one here for you, which is if you was kind of, you know, in a... In a in, this, this is hypothetical, obviously, but if you was in a desert island scenario... What is the one one item or possession that you'd take with you? you it can only be one one thing. Oh, it would have to be my multi tool. One, it would be one of those multi tools ah, with the, with the old There's there's yeah. a trend. There's a trend happening here. Good answer. Good answer. 
Well, I'd, I'd want to. I'd, I would want to be able to kill a coconut crab. If there was a really big crab that was big enough to like rip my, uh, you know, arms off and stuff, mm-hmm. I'd want something that I could at least give it a, a good run for its money. You know, all job just over the head, split its skull, maybe. Maybe kill it with a coconut. <laughs> with a, co- you know, yeah, I, I try and I, I try with a coconut. Maybe I'd, I'd put the blade on top of the, the crab's head and then pop it with the coconut on top, you know, for the energy. Yeah, a little um, double one. It's like the old, uh, yeah, bit of a <laughs> circus area pressure job. Yep, straight down. <laughs> oh, you know what? Wait, can, can I can I change my answer? Yeah. I, okay, there's, there's a machete that I have that also has like a saw blade and some tools attached if you if you unscrew it. Okay, that, so I'm thinking actually the machete would be better because, or the machete, so that I, cause I could swing it. It's got a handle, and that would really take out. So, like, if there's any kind of a big animal at all, I'd really be able to chop that sucker pretty Is that good. kind of like a, like a sickled machete almost, like a little, you know, you can... Yeah, yeah. Even if there was a wolf on the island or a small bear, maybe even a cat, I'd, cat. I'd be able to... <laughs> Maybe uh, <laughs> they're out there. I've, I've not done my meow. Uh, sound meow. Session, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's, cats, there's cats everywhere. Cats are very, very dangerous. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place. Though. My ears yeah. are going nuts. <laughs> it's a very cat, you might have cat filled fight, episode. You might have fight, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just waiting for one to walk across Milo's screen any minute. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll, so, we'll have to so, have some cat walking. <laughs> My, my I've got like a, got like a, um, it's a, it's a Japanese pruning saw and it's a really, really cool item for kind of like sawing, you know, pruning down little branches. It does exactly what it says on the tin, but it's very, very incredibly sharp. It has these like really fine serrated, uh, serrated teeth, but it absolutely excellent for, for cutting stuff and just, yeah, kind of clearing areas and things. Great, great little tool, but <laughs> no, no, Pruning meaning like destruction, right? Like you destroy anything with it. Uh, no, pruning's more just like you're kind of clearing a, a very like kind of smallish area, but not like so. Oh, so which... like where it, where a chainsaw would go through, say you know, a full trunk of a tree, the pruning saw will just take like kind of one inch um, branches or whatever. So, but handy oh, okay. if you want to clear an area. Yeah, it's for, it's for the smaller branches. Yeah. Not, not as destructive as like a chainsaw. No, no, it's literally if you're kind of like it's like a bush tool really more than anything because if you're out and about, you can just clear an area and, and kind of use those, you know, use those branches and things to make shelter and things like that. So yeah, it's a cool, cool little tool to be fair. The strangest, yeah, um, yeah. That's a. I, it would be. It would have to be. Yeah. I mean, the the machete is a multi tool also. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, we're ha- as always fantastic talking to you again, Rob. But we probably should wrap up here uh, before we go. Do you have any projects that you're working on now that Hollywood is opened back up that you want to uh, mention? Oh yeah. Well, we're we're working on the haunted curve still, mm. uh, and Stevens is recording uh, audio for that. You've got you've got some photos of her. Um, and there was, uh, there were two things that I wanted to mention. Yeah. Okay. There were a couple of things. Um, I forget what one of the terms was. I think it was, uh, oh gosh. Uh, the new horror cynicism. Okay. That's my term. I've coined this term. If I can be presumptuous that way to call it the, the uh, new horror cynicism. Yeah. yeah. The new horror cynicism. Okay. is what I call the current trend in horror entertainment. And I define this trend as uh, taking the idea of horror being a genre that deals with um, primal fears, universal fears, right? And sort of obsessing on that, the obsessing on, on the death and horror and gruesomeness aspect of it to the exclusion of anything else. Okay. And whereas in 
previous iterations of culture, we have had morality plays and fairy tales that use the horrific elements as uh, 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 signposts to warn us away from the dangers of reality, metaphorically. Uh, now, as, as Kevin has pointed out, yeah, we're sort of celebrating and uh, deifying these kinds of horror icons. And I think that's, a, that's an unhealthy philosophical practice in storytelling. Like the, uh, so the, new, like the new Leatherface movie that just came out? Texas Chainsaw mm, Massacre actually, movie? I, have, I haven't seen anything new in a very long time. I'm talking about the, the general tw- trend that's been occurring for about maybe 15 or 20 years now. Yeah, I can see that. that. I perceive that. It's a, it's a very big, it's a very large thing. It's a movement. Uh, it's a philosophical yeah, it's, movement. It, it's, it's, it certainly is, because, I mean, there's, there's definitely, even in so, so-called some of the, the more fun or softer, you know, softer films and movies, even those, the stories still kind of lean to glamorizing, you know, the the bad and, be, you know, people, you know, people kind of being the viewer being convinced to emulate the the bad parts rather than, you know, the, the moral moral parts of the story. If there is any moral part to the story at all, because yeah. sometimes it's just pure. If there is, death. You're, you're, yeah. you're absolutely correct about that. Um. And the, the other concept that I wanted to discuss, which is part of the, the haunted curve, is called, I guess I'm going to call it functional character, functional character writing or functional characterization. And what that is, is uh, we're going to assume that um, all human beings are a essentially the same uh, in terms of their uh, level of intelligence and that there's no determining factor in your background, like your birth, your genetics, or your culture, that's necessarily going to turn you into a bad person. Uh, That those are uh, your, in other words, your character, the quality of your character, your moral character is something that is randomly determined by various factors throughout your lifetime. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So kind of like a, like, not leaning towards like a kind of fate kind of. Um, yeah, uh, but functionally, what it means is you'll have like uh, the bad guy and the good guy, or the bad girl and the good girl. But none of those characters, okay, in the story, are going to be written as belonging to any specific ethnic group or religious group or belief system group. They are simply listed as people, as characters, okay? To, generally speaking, with some exceptions. Uh, for example, uh, one of the theories uh, working might be, okay, we're gonna turn everything on its end. So because dark usually represents evil and light and, good, uh, light and brightness usually represent good, we're going to make all of the evil things look very bright and good in this story. And all of the actually good things look kind of dark and evil visually. Okay. So that you're going to uh, judge these characters based on what they do rather than how they appear. In other words, the people wearing black leather jackets are the good guys and the people wearing uh, bright, sunny, comfortable shirts and being talkative are the very evil people. Okay. But none of that is determined by their race or their belief or or anything about them other than their actual behavior itself. Yeah, I get you. It's kind of more inferior, which is, um, I, I, I like, I like the kind of polarization effects because obviously society, you know, has been maybe conditioned to see it the other way. So it's it's good to kind of put that polarization technique on there and to see how an audience reacts. A bit like kind of saying, you know, and the, none of the red shirts actually die. Um uh, which, uh, which would be a, a, Yeah, that's like that's what I would do. I would like yeah. you could start off with that. You could you could Because first, everyone's yeah, thinking anyone that's watching is expecting movie, that, yeah. yeah. Like the first 
scene in the Star Trek movie is a bunch of red shirts get on the planet for an, an away mission, and you expect something to happen to all of them because of their the brightness of their red shirts. Yeah, and because of the and historical then, metaphor that that series is right. constantly, you know, indoctrinated into the viewer. You know, okay, throw a curveball in there and say, "Hey, there we go. Look, they made it." I, um, I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it, in in this case, however, like specifically in this case, it's a kind of an a racial thing where yeah, absolutely. I don't yeah. I don't want to write any of the characters to be that particular way because of the way they appear genetically. That has nothing to do with it. Yeah, um, they're just they're just humans, or they're just a species, and that's it. And it's there's nothing. There's no kind other, of, yeah. attached connotation to it to a to a to a degree, but I, I imagine right. that is a that is another like, kind of cracking conversation we could do. Again, it's been absolute, That's absolutely absolutely. You're, ask, you're asking about the the current projects and and the current projects involve. See, I could just give you a title and say, oh yeah, it's about monsters, it's about vampires, but no, no, I totally actually, totally gauge yeah, what the kind of projects. Looking, looking to head it's, towards it's experimental in form, and you might say, see, if we're if we're trying to fight against the new horror cynicism, mm -hmm. see, I believe that the new horror cynicism is actually tied to all those negative things in society that we're allowing to occur. Yeah, it could easily and be the way to the way to uh, uh, respond to the. Um, the new horror cynicism is to create horror media that is unusually positive and happy in nature. Absolutely, Rod. Right, I'm going to throw in one. I'm just going to say thanks, actually, to all of our the viewers and also our viewer questions, which pose some pose some interesting ones to help us rip it up again. And I'm going to fire thanks. one last thing around to us all just before we go. So, okay. Rod, Rod, Milo, and myself, I want to everyone give a quick answer. Cheese rolling, would you take part in it? Rod. <laughs> no. <laughs> Milo. Uh, I might, actually. That's, I, though I wouldn't be hardcore about it. I wouldn't be one of the people that's like hauling ass down the hill and tumbling over his head. I'd take it slow. I think I'm going to be the guy who's actually, I'll be on the cheese. Literally just mm. riding the cheese down the hill. Like, come on, I want the cheese, man. It's like, <laughs> wow. I'll I, give it a go. I, yeah. I've, never, I've never been so frightened of cheese as I was when I saw the film of the people running down the hill after <laughs> one. Yeah, I couldn't believe how many people they showed being dragged off that hill. Like, literally, nine, like being nine, carried off. Nine pound, nine pound, ah, nine pound roll yeah. of cheese as well. You know, I mean, that's yeah, in in kind of European uh, and, and terms, that's that kind of uh, what is it, two and a half pounds per kilo. If, so, if you if you think three Stilton kilos, is scary, well, this is much scarier than Stilton, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, definitely much scarier. Uh, that, that should be the tagline for the cheese, for the cheese chasing. Yeah, scarier mm. than Stilton. Facing cheese, facing cheese and much scarier than Stilton. There we go. There I'm going to suggest that to the uh, Gloucester show. <laughs> Episode uh, 20. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Rod. Take okay, care. Have a good one. You See too. Ya. Bye. Hey, Kev, what's coming up next on the show? Yeah, Milo, next time on Rip It Up, we've, um, we've got musician Noam Frank. And then coming up as well, we've also got director Pat Cardi. And we've got a Hollywood actor from Back to the Future 2 and 3. I'm not going to reveal the name yet, but um, you just keep your eyes peeled on the show and keep a watch out because those are all going to be great. I mean, the musician we've got coming up, Noam Frank, is... Beautiful, beautiful jazz singer. Um, director Pat Cardi has got some great, great stories as a child actor as well, starred alongside Kurt Russell. 
And yeah, the uh, Back to the Future guy is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about all three of those, to be honest. So. Me too, man. I am anxiously waiting for those ones. <laughs> He's anxious. He's like, <laughs> anxious. 